really the way to be productive is to figure out where you're trying to go, figure out what habits and what daily slash weekly routines you need to get there and just sitting down and doing the thing and then finding a way to make the thing fun so that you don't get distracted with other shit and then just doing the thing for a long time. So you did it. We talked three years ago and now it's real. We you talked three years ago. We talked on the 7th of October, 2023, which was really? like a year, three years and a week ago. That's nuts. And I was saying to you in that interview that like, hey, Ryan, you know, I've just started writing my first book. Any tips? Mm -hmm. And you gave some really good advice. Yeah. And what did I say? Do you remember? You said you said so much stuff. You said uh, the importance of structure. OK. The importance of having your materials assembled and kind of knowing what you want to say before you begin to write. Sure. And the analogy you used was like, you're like, well, you know, it would be weird if you decided to settle from New York and try and get to San Francisco. But you were just like, you know what, I'm just going to walk and I'm just going to figure it out along the way. You would, you know, it would be sensible to have a map. Although um, even well, yeah. I, I would say what actually, the problem is people don't even know they're trying to head towards San Francisco, mm. right? They just know they're trying to get somewhere and yeah. figuring out where you're trying to go as you're, as you're doing it, it's a bad idea. That was, that was a big part of my problem in that, like the destination changed radically, like every year in sure. the three year process. Where, sure. Yeah. Well, you do, you do the more, the problem is you're trying to figure out when you're working, when you're starting a book, you're trying to figure out the end result. Mm but you haven't done all the thinking required to know the end result. Yeah, this is why I think like the proposal was a bit of a scam. Because mm -hmm. the proposal, when I look at, compare the proposal to the final result, there's like almost nothing in there that, that's yeah. like the same. <laughs> but that's how it is in a, bus a business <laughs> yeah. plan. Very yeah. few businesses resemble the business plan. Mm. But there's an Eisenhower quote, he says, um, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Mm. And so I think it's actually similar there in that if you don't do a proposal. This is why I actually I think most self-published books don't work. It's that because there's no forcing function required to get approval to start. Mm. Um, there's no deadline. There's no constraints as to how long it can be, what it can look like. You can basically do whatever you want, which you would think would be an artistic sort of creative dream, but it's actually like, uh, potentially a death sentence. Okay, so here's something I'm struggling with at the yeah. moment. So um, I've been making videos on YouTube for the last like six and a bit years, made like 700 something videos. And like a couple of weeks ago, I had a sort of family health crisis and that gave me a newfound appreciation of mortality and stuff mm -hmm. as, it, as it tends to. And I started asking myself this question, um, you know, if money were no object, how would I be spending my time? Sure. And I realized I would still want to make YouTube videos and still write books but I would want to do it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to stick to an upload schedule. I don't I don't want to have stuff in the calendar. I liked the idea of an empty calendar, which is something that you also said sure. three years ago. Um, and I like being able, I, I like the idea of being able to write a book and make a video and stuff when I feel like it rather than on a deadline. Sure. And so I'm kind of saying to my team, guys, like, screw all the deadlines, screw all, you know, let's throw the upload schedule out the window. But I'm kind of worried, will that turn me into some sort of waste man who's not actually doing the thing? Yeah. No, it's it's tricky, right? Because if you were to talk to, let's say, a professional athlete and be like, "Okay, you have this uh, health scare," what what would it teach you? Be like, it it would really teach me how much I love football or how much I love basketball, right? And so they would still want it in their lives. Maybe they would change their relationship to it a little bit, but just winging it on your own is not how you are elite at a thing, yeah. right? So they're 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 it's. I agree. You want to sort of do it on your own terms. At the same time, if you are literally doing it on your own terms, you probably are not going to do it as well as you could do it or even do it in a way that is worth doing. Oh, okay. So it's like, look, you obviously the more YouTube videos you make, the more you realize um, that you should just be doing it for you, not for the audience, right? But if you truly didn't give a shit about the audience, why would you make them at all? Exactly. Right? Yeah. You would just not, you would make things, but it would never. So by publishing them, you are admitting that it is for other people at some level, right? At some level, yeah. And so it's it's not as simple as that. So I, I do try to, I think less about sales. For instance, I'm doing it for me in that sense. Mm. And yet I benefit from the deadlines. And I, I still, I can move the deadlines, but like, to to not have to not have anyone pushing back on you is uh look as a kid you think you want to be able to do whatever you want and you mm -hmm. want no rules but 
if you actually got that, you would have a miserable childhood mm -hmm. and you would turn out to be a miserable person. So you need constraints, you need guardrails. Yeah. Um, and what happens when people self-publish, I tend to find is that one, it just never happens, or two, um, they end up ignoring conventions that are actually important for the consumer generally. So books should roughly be a, a certain length. You know, they should, there's certain conceits or tropes that, that if they're not, it, it becomes needlessly transgressive. Sometimes you should transgress those things, but you need, you need, it all comes down to, you need some, just because you can doesn't yeah. mean you should. How, so how how do you think about this balance? Because like you've already made it, you can do whatever you want, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and yet you still write books on seemingly on a deadline because they mm -hmm. come up fairly frequently. Yeah. Like how do how do you balance these? Well, I do balance it. Uh, so I sold this four book series on the Cardinal Virtues. So I've done two, and then I finished the third, mm -hmm. and then I pushed it a year. So it's done. I'm taking more time to do it. Um, it's it's now like in in and the the deadlines or the the release is the summer of next year, but um, it, there's a tension. So on discipline, I felt like pushing it, and it was actually the right thing to push through. And the deadline forced me to get serious about it and do it right. And then on this book, I was actually more or less ahead of schedule and doing great, but then I decided for just family and lifestyle reasons to push it a year. So am I pushing it a year because I'm being lazy or am I pushing it because I want more time to do it well or I want it to fit more in a more balanced way into my life? You know, So I think uh, I, I function well with deadlines. I function well with the sort of day-to-dayness of it. And I think, again, people, th people think that the perk of success is being able to do whatever you want. And weirdly, you actually find that once you can do whatever you want, you need to self-impose constraints and boundaries if you want to keep doing it well and in a balanced way. Mm. Yeah, I found that when the pandemic hit and that was when I took, you know, took time out of full-time medicine for the first time, suddenly my whole calendar was empty. Yeah. And... I immediately realized that, uh oh, like <laughs> I kind of need some constraints here. And so I signed up like art lessons and singing lessons and piano lessons and stuff to give some structure to the day yeah. and fit in the YouTube and then some of, later some of the writing stuff around that. And I found that that was really nice, but it, 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 it always felt like a constant battle between kind of structuring myself and scheduling things in versus yeah. following my energy and like, oh, you know, today I have a lot of energy, therefore I want to film a video today versus yeah. oh, I don't really feel like it today, but like, mm. You know, I said, I said I would do it every day, that whole thing. Yeah, it, it'd be wonderful if inspiration was sufficient, but it, it usually isn't. Um, and you have to build a structure or a system. Uh, I think it's really important anyway. What does your, like, I guess, daily routine look like? What's what's the structure you've built around your? Um, I usually try to get up early. I'll give you an example though. I try to get up early. I try to take my kids for a walk. That's like the beginning of what we do. And this morning we got up, I got up early. I made their lunches. I, uh, just sort of having quiet time in the morning. And then my son got up and he got really into Legos and it was also cold. And so I was like, do I want to rip him out of this thing that I'm all, that's also good. That's also, I'm trying to encourage to have a fight over a thing that might spoil him and wanting to do the thing in future times, I'm gonna say no. Uh, so I sort of ripped up the playbook and then I made them breakfast and then I was taking a shower. And then um, literally as I'm getting in the shower, they wanted to go on a walk. Oh. Uh, and so uh, we ended up doing it, like we just sort of, so I, I guess in the 48 Laws of Power, the final law, which I think a lot of people miss is assume formlessness. So there's all these laws about do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. But the last law is a kind of a strategic flexibility. And so to answer your question earlier about how I think about this stuff, I, I have found as I've gotten older and more successful that the rigidity that served me well early on has had to give way into a kind of flexibility now there's always a tension or a, a concern. Is that is that flexibility actually just complacency or laziness, 
Um, and I have to question each time, wh why, what is my motivation here? But, but that rigidity has to become flexibility or one, you suck all the fun out of it. And two, it's not sustainable over a long period of time. And it's not, it's very susceptible to being disrupted or blown apart by the complexity of life. Mm. So I'm, I'm less, I have less of a routine and I have more practices that I try to do consistently. Yeah. And I move them around depending on what's happening. What are some of those practices? Well, I try to get up early. I try to walk. I try to do some form of hard exercise every day. I try to not eat until, like I try to have kind of a fasting window. Um, and then I try, to, I try to do writing before I do other things. Hmm. Okay. So like I am flexible on a lot of stuff, but I don't write at three in the afternoon because that's not conducive to doing it well. So so just you kind of know what goes it's more of a an intuition or a gut feel as opposed to when I was younger, it was like it was almost it was almost a form of OCD. Like it has to happen at this time. If it doesn't happen at this time, then there is distress. And and that distress you're almost doing the tasks to avoid the distress, which is not a good way yeah. to live. And how did having kids change your relationship with the work? Well, it just blows your whole life up. Yeah. And in a good way, but it blows your whole life up. I remember this New York Times reporter was doing this piece on me right as my son was being born. And she, she asked me like, how do you think, you know, like having kids is gonna change your routine? And I said something like, I don't think it'll change it at all. And which was of course preposterous and, uh, and uh, very naive, but uh, it's just totally blown it apart. But it gives you important stuff that you center your life around. So like, I think people are concerned that like having kids or getting married, it'll tie you down. And it does, mm. it objectively does, but it ties you down to reality. Like it tethers you to the earth. Mm. There are school starts at a time and it ends at a time. Like there's nap time, there is, eating time, there is activities that happen every week, you know, there's stuff, right? And so it prevents you from making it all about you. Mm. Uh, and it forces you to sort of have non-negotiable things. I mean, I guess it doesn't force you, you could be a bad parent if you want, but if you want your kids to not be a nightmare, you realize like routine is very important, structure is very important, but then also rigidity is, you know, um, impossible. There's um, uh, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda was talking about how he had a kid right as Hamilton blew up, and so he would do the play, and then it's the hottest thing in the world, and so every night celebrities attend, and then they come backstage and they go, "We're going here after. We're going here." I mean, he was getting invited, all this like incredible stuff, and he had to say no to all of it because he had to get home. He had to get home, not just because he wanted to see his kid, but um, he knew that his sleep was already a precarious touch and go thing because he has an infant in his house. Mm. So if he stays out till like two in the morning and then he gets home and he's woken up five times in the middle of the night or whatever, he's just not gonna be able to perform the night before, mm. the, the next night. And so his point was that having a kid actually saved him from spinning off the planet from this kind of stratospheric success that he has. And I, I have found that for sure, that like, again, we think these things are gonna be baggage. It's more like ballast, like it balances you out um, in a way that thinking, hey, I'm totally unencumbered. I can do whatever I want. I can fully enjoy all the fruits of all the cool stuff that's happening. You think that's what you want, but it's kind of a recipe for disaster. Oh, okay. That's so interesting to hear because I guess I've been I've been feeling a bit burnt out from, you know, the whole like rush to finish the book and then all of the batch filming podcasts and YouTube videos and the audiobook then and then like all of this book promo stuff that it is apparently sure. sensible to do and all all this kind of thing. Yeah. And the conclusion I came to a few days ago, like was screw it. I just want an empty calendar, a fully empty calendar. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess <laughs> I'm sure if I experienced that for a few weeks, I'd be like, ah, actually. I probably want a bit more structure well, in my I life. Want, I, you want an empty calendar of the stuff that you, you want it emptied of the stuff that you don't want to do. Mm. 
So like when I have an empty calendar, that means I have as much time as I want to write and as much time as I want to spend time with my family. Mm -hmm. What I haven't scheduled is interruptions from those things. Yeah, nice. um, even if those things are fun or interesting or whatever. Hmm. Nice. By the way, I was reading your your bio. It, it does oh, you yeah. it does you no justice. It says four point five million YouTube subscribers, and it says over ninety three million total views. Yeah, but it's way more than that. Yeah, it's like four point eight, four point nine now. No, no, no. You've done like hundreds of millions of YouTube views. Have we? Yeah. Oh, I don't even look at that number. <laughs> but you don't. <laughs> no. Really? I made it a point early in the journey. I think uh, thanks to all the stoicism Kool-Aid that I was drinking yeah. to only focus on the things that were within my control <laughs> Okay. Uh, to the point that I almost never look at analytics. And the only thing I can I even vaguely keep track of is like, oh, oh yeah, I mean, I was watching one of my own videos and it said 4.9 million rather than 4.8 million because it, it doesn't even give you the... Sure, no, as you get yeah. more, the numbers get less precise because yeah. you... It yeah. matters less. And I can see it in YouTube Studio if I go on and, and, and stuff. And I'll occasionally do that just to look at comments and, and, and things. But I don't know. I really try, like, the, the, more, the more I look at the numbers, the less happy I am with the creative output. Well, so, so <laughs> tell me why stoicism taught you not to look at how your YouTube videos are doing. That's very interesting to me. I realized that when I would look at how my YouTube videos were doing, in the back of my mind, there would always be that sense of, you know, the whole like dichotomy of control thing. Mm -hmm. it, it sort of like n number of views on a YouTube video is sort of in the in the intersection where it's partly in my control, but partly outside of my control. Um, and I knew that if I like looking at those, I, I wasn't able to look at them purely dispassionately. And I would always get a sense, of, oh, that one didn't do so well. Sure. Oh, that one did. Oh, that one didn't. Um, and I found that you know, if I if I keep a general eye on the trend over sort of a period of several months, that gives me all the data I need to be like, oh, that sort of topic is really resonating with the audience. That sort of video got like a thousand comments compared to 300. That helps me figure out, okay, maybe what, like, I should do more of this and less of that. Yeah. But I try not to take it too far because, you know, you get the whole audience capture thing where you become a caricature of... Um, of the person that your audience initially initially enjoyed. Yeah. And I fell I very much fell into this trap during the pandemic actually. So, um the word productivity in my videos was like really taking off. Yeah. Any video with the word productivity or productive in it, I was like it immediately like doing super well. And so I was thinking, well, you know, this does really well. Let me yeah. just say every put productive in everything. My yeah. productive day in the life, my productive desk setup, my productive dating habits, my productive sleeping routine and all this kind of stuff. And after a, after a few videos of it, like people in the comments started to be like, okay, this is getting a bit much. And I started feeling icky about the content sure. because I was putting productive in it to try and get the views Yeah, because videos with the word productive in it were getting more views. <sighs> I don't know. Whenever I, f I, I, I have this sort of weird relationship with numbers versus what's in my control. Well, it's, it's interesting too because it's somewhat in your control as you're making it. But then once it's out, it's done. Yeah. But that's when we spend the most time like refreshing like it, yeah. we've you've you you flung it to the public yeah. you've put it out and now you're like well do they like me do they like me do they like me how much do they like me give yeah. me all the likes yeah. right um when if there was any time to think about how something was going to do it maybe could have been as you were making it right but now that's over so now you're really just emoting about what you would like to happen mm. and the ship has sailed yeah Man, that's so true. Like oh, the the way we do use analytics is in idea generation and titles yeah. and thumbnails. Yeah, and that's the thing. Thankfully, one of my team members does because yeah. I don't I I don't get joy out of trying to package up a video with the perfect title and thumbnail to make it clickbaity enough, but not so clickbaity that it feels clickbaity. Right. So I come up with the concept that hey, I'd love to do a video about I don't know Ryan's new book. Yeah. And we were like, okay, cool. We can't call it Discipline is Destiny because that would be a bit weird. We okay, we've got to find a, an angle of like the one habit that's changing your life, like the discipline expert or yeah. like how do sure. we, you know, all that kind of stuff. I outsource that to the team. <laughs> and then they tell me, okay, we've, we've tested this with the audience. We think the best title is this book made me more disciplined. And mm -hmm. I'm like, great, I can make a video based on that title. Sure. Yeah. And it's also, it's not just one of the ways I've found it to be dangerous is actually when it works. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, an article comes out about you and it's positive or a video comes out and it's doing well. 
um, your, your book is out, whatever, you're doing the thing, and then you lose you lose a day or more than a day just kind of basking in it. You're just like refreshing and watching. Mm. Like, so it's not even like you're torturing yourself, you feel crappy that nobody likes you. But you're, it's like your reward for succeeding is a loss in productivity because you're just soaking in this thing that's really not in your control that if it had gone the other way, you would be trying to work your mind around not taking it seriously. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. You'd be like, that's not why I made it. What matters is that I like it. What matters is how it does it in the long term. You'd be trying to think through logically why you shouldn't be devastated by this bad news. Mm. But then when the positive happens, you don't do any of that. Yep. And you just, <laughs> you just kind of sit there and soak it in. And really the punishment though, is that you're not spending your energy where it matters or where it makes a difference, which is like making the next thing yeah. or just taking the day off. Like. If you're gonna waste a day, go waste a day. Don't mm. waste a day refreshing your Twitter feed. Mm. Yeah, there was that. Um, I think it's that like Zen proverb or something, which is you know before enlightenment, after enlightenment. Yeah. B before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After mm -hmm. enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Sure. And I I often think of that when it comes to videos, and I I also suspect with the book. Because I think currently I have an unhealthy attachment to the New York Times bestseller list, as as a lot of writers do. Um, but I just tr really try to remind myself of whether or not the video does well. You know, learn stuff, write about it, make a video. It's like that's that's the thing, and it's like getting back to the process rather than thinking we, at all about the outcome. We asked me about self publishing earlier. One, I've experienced this unintentionally and intentionally when the obstacles way came out. Uh, I'd already sold the sequel, and so in one respect, that probably cost me a lot of money because The Obstacles Away did over the next year or two start to do really well. So if I had waited, I probably mm. could have sold what became Ego is the Enemy for a lot of money, uh, a lot more money. And I was, but I'd actually sold like a proposal version of it while I was still figuring the book out. Yeah. So I was under, I, I was still figuring, doing the work of figuring the book out, but I was under contract. So I really didn't care that the book kind of was doing okay and then I really didn't care that much when it started to do well. Like that right there is the the, the first time that book hit the bestseller list, which was five years after it came out. Oh, wow. Nice. So I, I'd not only written the next book, but I'd written several more books. Like I, by having contracts for the next projects, I was just focused on doing the next projects, mm -hmm. not on how each one did. And then with this four book series, it's kind of been the same thing. Like. In 2019, I sold, I basically locked myself in till 2024, 2025. So basically like the next four or five years of my thing were locked in. So again, the downside is uh, courage came out, it did okay. Discipline came out, it did spectacular. So maybe I could have been selling, I could have sold justice for more, but um, all of that was irrelevant yeah. because I was just in the middle of writing the book. And I think it's better to be chopping wood and carrying water than going, re constantly renegotiating your rate for what you are gonna chop wood and carry water for yeah. or whatever, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Totally. Like, like to just have the next thing. So, yeah. you know, if your thing is I make a video every week, you are already making the next video before one comes out, Yeah. right? A comedian, comes up with an hour, records the hour, then there is time before that hour comes out. And it's in that interim period that they're already working on the next hour. Yeah. So if the special comes out and it's a huge hit, they're working on the next hour. If the special comes out and it's not a huge hit, they're working on the next special. Mm -hmm. And you wanna be in a rhythm like that because it insulates you from the thing that's not in your control, which mm -hmm. is whether other people say you're amazing or whether other people say you suck. Nice. Yeah, I feel like all of all of this stuff comes back down to comes back down to the process. And, yes. You know, a big part of what we talk about in, in that book is um, you know, trying to find a way to make the process enjoyable and energizing. Um and yeah, I find that when I have that in at the front of my mind when it comes to the videos or even even writing the book, you know, like there were periods in the book journey where I sort of forgot to enjoy the process mm -hmm. because the seriousness of writing a book was like weighing on me. And then I would read like, I don't know, one of your 
like your newsletter or one of your books or like Drive by Dan Pink, and I'm like, oh, it's so good. This stuff is so good, and I'd be comparing it to my first draft and be like, why am I? Why is my writing so shit? Um, and it would take my editor to remind me that you know, Ali, the whole the whole message of the book is find a way to make it enjoyable and, and energizing. So, you know, <laughs> well, it's hard if people say trust the process, mm. right? But it's hard to trust a process that you have not been through before. Mm. And so, um, once you've done it. One time, you have a sense of the full scope of the process or what you think is a full scope of the process. Mm. Then you do it again and again and again, and you start to go, oh yeah, this is the part where you start to doubt yourself. This is the part where you get excited, but uh, like in Texas, we have this season, it's called false fall. Mm. So it's cool and awesome right here. It'll probably get hot again, right? Like yeah. we think we think the summer's finally broken, but there's actually like several more hot days coming. Projects are like that too. You think you're over the hump, you think you've done it, and then, oh wait, no, it's gonna get hard again. But you 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 start to get a sense of the rhythms of it. And then you can trust the process. And then you can also enjoy the process because, you know, it's like the first time you go on a roller coaster, that specific roller coaster, you have no idea. Is this gonna be one of the ones where it's like this? Or is it gonna be the ones of you right? But then once you've done it before, then you have some, you can kind of anticipate it and you know when to hold on tight and when you can just go with it, right? And you can kind of watch the other people that have never been on it before, how much scary it is for them. And so I think it's 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 not quite sufficient to just say trust the process because it's it's hard to trust a process that you have not been through. Yeah, that's so true. I think, like, so I, I've, I realized this very um, sort of tangibly. So, uh, you know, I've made like 700 plus YouTube videos in my time and I know that recording it always feels like a total shit show where I'm making so many mistakes and there's so much like crap in it. Sure. But I've done it enough times. I know the final product is going to be good because our, our editor's amazing. Sure. <laughs> we'll chop out all the crap sure. and we'll make it look amazing. But then when beginner YouTubers see the final result and then they see themselves recording and mm -hmm. suddenly they're spluttering and swearing all the time and yeah. you never see that raw uncut version of a YouTuber's first yes. take. You only see the final product. And so now that I've been to the, through the process once with the book, knowing how crap the first draft was and then seeing the magic of editing over several months to trim it down and make it good. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't mind so much about having a crappy first draft now. Well, yeah, you have your you have your crappy first draft. I actually have a shirt. That's, uh, there's a Hemingway quote and he says, uh, I have a print of it in my office. And I have a shirt too, but he, he says, uh, you know, the first draft of everything is shit. <laughs> and uh, the, the conceit is that it's sort of showing how even that sentence probably he didn't write it perfectly the mm. first time. But the idea when is that every every first draft sucks and you want to get comfortable with that. You have to get comfortable with the messiness of the, the process. But weirdly, as you get better, I do think your first drafts get less shitty or less wasteful, mm. right? So like um, you with your videos, and certainly I found this with my books, is that there is less and less left over at the end because you start to be able to shoot only what you know you're going to use, mm -hmm. or you write less, you go down less blind alleys as a writer, or you you overwrite less because again, you know, you know what isn't going to be possible, what's going to be extraneous. Mm. You have a sense of what you actually need, mm. right? So you're trusting the process, but also you understand the process better. Mm. And so, yeah, when you're, you, you tend to be overdoing whatever it is you're doing the first time. Yeah. And then one of the signs of mastery, or I guess a, a trait of mastery is the conservation of energy. Mm. Like, you know, when and what to apply at any given moment. Whereas when you're just starting or you're doing it for the first time, there's a lot of just kind of sheer force of will and enthusiasm, mm. which is important, but often inefficient. Yeah. You, I imagine yeah. <laughs> a video three years ago, maybe you shot an hour of footage for a 10 minute video. Mm. And hopefully now you could shoot it's 20 bit, minutes yeah. of footage for a 10 minute video. Yeah, it is a little bit tighter now than it was before. Um, but even like, yes, especially on the writing front, initially my my worry was I don't have enough material. And yeah. then after the first draft, I was like, oh much. my God, I have way too much material. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you find 
But I think writing becomes a process much more of tightening as mm -hmm. you go because you realize you just needed to get it all down. And then you're realizing, oh, I've said this twice now. And actually mm -hmm. here covers it over here. So I can, they cancel each other out or yeah. I can get rid of one. So it's, it's a process of understand, understanding that. So I have a question about productivity for you because I feel like people are obsessed with productivity mm. and I'm not always sure why. Like I, I said this thing once, maybe you agree with it, but it's like that amateurs are obsessed with tools, right? Like what's the best software to do this? Yeah. What is the best way? You know, like people will go like, what, what kind of uh, pen do you journal with? Yeah. Like this fucking matters at all, right? Go, what, what program do you write with? Um, and if I was to rank the things that contribute the most to what I do, tools are like not even in the top 10. Yeah, that was kind of, <laughs> I was, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, the tool is maybe the extra 1% left over at the end, yeah. potentially, if like writing in Scrivener is just a little bit nicer than writing in a Google Doc. Sure. But like, this is the thing, like, as I've basically tried to read basically every productivity book on the market, um, and then some, it all fundamentally comes down to really the way to be productive is to figure out where you're trying to go figure out what what habits and what daily slash weekly routines you need to get there and just sitting down and doing the thing. Yes. And then finding a way to make the thing fun so that you don't get distracted with other shit and then just doing the thing for a long time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and if having a slightly, I mean, I have a really crappy pen that I stole from my brother now because my fountain pen ran out of ink and it was such a nice fountain pen, but like I can write just as well with a like crappy ballpoint. <laughs> yes. The the 1% tweaks. Um, but it's so much more, it's, it's it's almost like, you know, I'm 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 trying to trying to get into fitness now. And I just love researching, you know, on running shoes, should I get this padding versus that padding? Been for a run maybe once in the last six months, but yeah. I love the idea of researching running gear because it's great procrastination from actually doing the thing, which is put on anything and just go for a run. Yes. Or like just go to the gym and do anything with progressive overload. Yeah, it's like people are optimizing a thing they're not doing. Yes. Which which is never going to be the way to get there. There was a great uh, a great moment um, that uh, my my girlfriend called me out, uh, out on this the other day. Uh, you know the whole like sauna ice plunge. Everyone mm -hmm. in Austin seems to be doing it. Yes. I was saying to her, hey, you know, what if I join a gym and it's like you know depending on how busy the sauna is, like you know Huberman says like four times versus five times and like twenty four minute protocol versus twelve minute protocol, and she was like. You've been to the sauna once in the last six months. Yeah. Let's let's just go to the sauna first, and then we can worry about optimizing it later. Sure. And I was like, yeah, so true. <laughs> but no, I think this obsession with productivity, it often feels productive to be reading productivity books, ironically, and researching the tools as a distraction from just sitting down and doing the thing. Well, the irony that obsessing about productivity is a form of procrastination, mm. right? It's giving you the, the sense that you are serious that your heart's in the right place that you are trying or making progress but in fact you're not mm -hmm. and you're avoiding the hard thing which is doing the thing doing the thing there is one aspect of i think um there's the, there, there is one aspect of productivity that i think is valuable to obsess over and that is kind of journaling prompts and just ask, asking yourself serious questions about why you're doing the thing that you think you want to do where you're actually trying to go I spend a lot of time, like, comparatively, like thinking, is the direction I'm currently going in actually the direction that I want to be going in? Sure. And I find that there's almost no amount of too much journaling that can that can happen there because, you know, in like an hour of journaling, I might land on one insight, which is, which would, if if it nudges my course even like zero point one percent, that compounds over the long term. Well, yeah, I would say being intentional about what you're doing and then clear with yourself about why and what you are doing mm. is really important. Whereas like productivity, a lot of productivity advice seems to me is like optimized, optimizing for how you're gonna pack your suitcase or what your suitcase is, mm. is, is or what brand it is or whatever. And you really haven't questioned why you're going, where you're going, or if you should be going there, yeah. if it's the right time to be going <laughs> yeah. there. Any of the actually important questions that are gonna determine whether this thing is a success or not. Mm. Yeah, I think the other unfortunate thing is, uh, you know, we, we did a video recently that was something like, I read 107 productivity books, here's what actually works. 
And all of it was basically like pick some goals, figure out the method. It was like the, the, the basic stuff. And then we made another video that was like 12 productivity tools I can't live without. And yeah. that video did so much better. And I'm like, oh, yes. it's so annoying that like the thing that had the meat versus the thing that had the candy, the candy performs better. Yes. And so writ large, you know, the incentives are there for people who write or make videos or whatever about this stuff is to lean into the tools because the tools are the thing that, you know, is the candy that people want. Well, I don't even know if it's candy. It's just, it's it's concrete, right? So you can go, mm. here's this sort of ephemeral, you know, metaphysical question about why you're doing it, what success is, you know, why does it matter? You're asking these qu big picture questions. And by the time you get to the end of it, there actually isn't an answer because it's about the question. Mm. And that's a lot less clear than these are the three best pens. This is the number one bit of software. Yeah. Or here's a really interesting, complicated system that a successful person mm. uses whose work you are a fan of. Yeah. Right? Like one is very concrete and the other is essentially ineffable. Right. And so you naturally, especially at the early stages, one's much more digestible and understandable. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, you're, you're also contemplating questions that someone, if they're a, an aspiring high school insert, you know, um, is not even going to understand as a question. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like Tom Brady talking about whether you know, how much is enough or, you know, where to find deep motivation or whatever. That's a lot for someone who's not even competed at an elite level to think about. So it's easier to start with, well, what do you have for breakfast? Mm. Right. Or like, what, what kind of gloves do you wear? Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. one, one is much more relatable and accessible, but ultimately much more inconsequential. Yeah. I do, I do find that there are some tools that certainly when I was more of a beginner in the space helped develop the habit, which was the thing that actually mattered. So okay. for example, uh, reading about uh, how different people do a weekly review mm -hmm. is quite helpful and I you know I downloaded like the initially the PDF template and then the Google Docs template and now notion templates are all the all the rage um, but the point is the weekly review journaling prompt slash questions helped me actually do a weekly review and a weekly review is just a very useful habit to figure out like how do I do this week what what are my top three things I want to do next week great let's just do those things so there are there are, there are some instances in which a tool, helps build the habit which when where the habit is the thing that matters sure but it's easy to take it too far like i, I find whenever i rewatch your video about your note, note card system i know i'm just procrastinating because <laughs> the thing you actually do is, is, is you write every day <laughs> but i'm always, like even in the car on the way here i was like you know what if i had an analog note card system and then i'm like no but i'm traveling it's like oh well i get dang it like <laughs> let me look at the zettelkasten system or let me find another app and it's so easy for the mind to go in, the, in those directions because it's like Ryan Holiday has a note card system. I also find it's like, um, you know, like people who believe one conspiracy theory tend to believe all the conspiracy theories, yeah. right? Even though it actually becomes less likely that they're all true, right? Mm. Like it's like if you pick one and that's your thing, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But if you believe all of them simultaneously, well, they contradict each other. So it doesn't mm. really work, right? But it's like I tend to find pro people who are really into productivity systems. The problem isn't that, you know, that this system is not as good as this system. It's that they're missing the point that a lot of it is a placebo, which is like pick a fucking system and stick with that system. That's the hat. Like you're supposed to pick a thing and then that's your thing, right? And then you stop thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, the problem is they're like, first they're over here and then they hear this one's a little bit better and then they switch to the So it's actually, it's not the system that's the problem. It's not the tools that that's actually the amateur quality. The amateur quality is the, constantly moving and abandoning, moving and abandoning, because that's what's profoundly inefficient, right? Like like you've you found the system and it was working for you. Like I know actually at this point, there's probably something better than the note card system, but is it transformatively better? Probably not. 
right? So am I going to uproot the thing that I'm comfortable with, that works for me, that my old stuff is in for something that's 9% better? Mm. Like if, I'm, if I want a 9% productivity increase, that's pretty easy to find. You know what I mean? As opposed to relearning how I do everything. Yeah. So uh, back in the day, I used to, I used to be a, a close-up magician and I would perform at like balls and parties at university and stuff. And there was a, a phrase that was often, um, you know, in the, in the world of magic, the, the amateur magician is, is the person who performs a hundred tricks to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the amateur magician is the person who, who performs a hundred tricks to the same audience. Whereas the professional magician is the one who performs the same tricks to a hundred different audiences. Yes. Or words to that effect. And sure. in the world of magic as well, there was this constant thing, constant like battle between, you know, on the forums, there are the professionals who are actually doing the thing. And then there are all the amateurs being like, what are the best tricks? Yeah. And the professionals are like, it doesn't matter. Just pick three to six of them and just do them at nauseum and yeah. you will guaranteed be a professional magician. And the yeah. amateurs are like, oh, but like, I've got a thousand dollars. I want to spend it on like this trick versus that trick versus that trick. Just like, yes. it, it doesn't matter. Just pick a few and just stick with them and do them repeatedly over a long enough time. And that is how you get good at the thing. But that's a lot less sexy sounding advice than this one, this one trick will change your life. Yeah, like I've been to conferences that have changed my life, but I'm always interested when I notice people are going to lots of them. Like the chances that every single one is going to have that same effect is very low, right? Yeah. And so it's like, you should, you, you beat the casino, leave. You yeah. know what I mean? Like um, there's this tendency to sort of chase more and more when you've already gotten most of the gains. I had some, uh, I've got some friends who, who attended like a sort of $85,000 mastermind week-long retreat type thing. Yeah. And after day one, they were like, damn, we know what we have to do. <laughs> yeah. We kind of want to leave and just do it. But like yeah. we've paid $85,000, so we've got to kind of stay for the next five days, knowing full well that like all of this is going straight over their head because they, they just got know the what thing. they got the one thing. And they right. just need to execute on the one thing. And then two years later, maybe the thing number two or three will become relevant. Yes. But by then you've forgotten about it and you'll need to go to another event. <laughs> Yeah, so to back to procrastination, my, one of my favorite quotes from Seneca is he says, the one thing all fools have in common is that they're always getting ready to start, right? So like they're going to do it tomorrow mm -hmm. or they're going to do it later. They're going to do it once they get all the, the materials or tools that they needed. So I did give you the advice that to, to start a book, you want to do all your research first, which is true. And yet really the important thing is that at some point you start doing it, yeah. right? And because it can go on forever, the sort of, preparing and analyzing and gathering and you know i just need this other thing first i just but really what you need to be doing is the thing mm. <laughs> yeah it, it, it always just comes down to this it comes comes back back to this um and i've I, I, I don't know if you've played around with this but I've i've experimented with so many different ways of doing the thing some you know when it comes to videos for example some day some some weeks i'm like okay the way I'm going to keep doing the thing is I'm just going to make a video every single day mm -hmm. and then I'll do that for a bit. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, but that's like too rigid. And I was like, well, more flexibility. It's like, okay, cool. Tim Ferriss says batching is good. So I'm yeah. going to batch it and Thursdays are going to be my filming day. And it's like, I'll do that for a bit. And I'll be like, oh no, but like I missed that Thursday. And then I'll be like, you know, Tim Ferriss said batching is good. So why don't I batch in a whole week and film 15 videos in that week? And then I can chill for six weeks and then this was supposed to be a batch filming week in Austin and I felt nothing because <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm actually not feeling it. So there's almost this constant search, at least in my life, for like this magical, consistent system that will cover me 100% of the time. Um, thankfully, we have just still been publishing like two videos a week for the last six years. So it's like, it's not, hopefully you're not going to take too much away from actually, actually doing the thing. But I wonder for you, like you've been doing this a lot, the, the, this sort of stuff a lot longer than I have. How 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 often has your system for doing the thing actually changed? Um, well, I do a, a handful of different things, right? So like, but the main thing, and I think this is important, you have to know what your main thing is, yeah. right? Is we live in a world where there's all these other kind of supporting things. They're necessary, yeah, not absolutely necessary, but I think they're important. And, but still you have to know what the main driver of everything is. Mm. And so for me, that's writing. Like writing the books is the main thing that, the other things are supporting the writing of the books yeah. and the writing of the books is creating the ideas and the platform and the brand and all the, that make the other things necessary to begin with. So the writing routine is essentially unchanged. 
Um, there's little tweaks here and there, but the main thing is like just sitting down and doing that thing. And it's not a thing that can be outsourced. It's not a thing that can be batched. It's the day-to-dayness of doing it on a consistent basis. To what extent do you enjoy writing? Uh, well, there's an expression I like that says, um, painters like painting, writers like having written. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the end of the writing day, I feel good. Do I feel good the entire time? Not always. Sometimes when it's fucking working, it's nothing better. But if you, that's the only thing that fuels you, you're going to, you're not going to be in a good spot. Because some days, some of the most important things come it's one sentence in the midst of two otherwise unproductive, pointless hours, yeah. you know? So I enjoy showing up and then I enjoy finishing. Mm. And sometimes that middle period can be torturous. Mm. So I was going to ask you that like when you say feel good productivity, mm. does it actually have to feel good? Uh, there, there's one school of thought that says it's all about finding the torture that you can tolerate. Mm. And it's actually the ability to put up with the grind of it that separates kind of the winners from the losers. Yeah, that's the thing. So I think it, my, my thesis in the book is that it doesn't have to feel good, but it is generally more energizing when it does. Sure. Generally, like positive emotions feel feel energy, feel creativity, feel like really stressed, all, all that all that fun stuff. And so the question that the question that led to the book in the first place was, you know, when I was trying to juggle working full time as a doctor and also building the YouTube channel and the business on the side, it just felt like a huge amount of grind in the day job and then a huge amount of grind afterwards to do the videos. And it seemed like, you know, everyone talks about how, you know, journey before destination. And I realized that I wasn't enjoying my day to day because of this sort of grind approach. And so I tried to find any tweak that I could to make it feel just a little bit better. And that's not to say that it was fun all the time or that it objectively felt good all the time. But I found a series of strategies that meant that almost anything I could make feel even just a bit better. And if it felt a bit better, it generated more energy and it meant that I had more energy at the end of the day to give to my my other hobbies and friends and family and stuff. And it also made me more productive. So I think it's like, you know, when it comes to writing, for example, there are some, some basic things that I found was, you know, the first chapter in the book is about play and about trying to approach things in the spirit of play. Now play, you know, a lot of people have talked about how it comes about as a result of, um, often a result of the stakes being lower so like Ro- Roger Federer probably isn't feeling play when he's in the Wimbledon fight final because sure. the stakes are too high. And I found that, for example, with 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 writing the book, when I when I was thinking about the stakes being high, like this is my first book and it's traditionally published and it's a big deal, that would suck the joy out of it. Yeah. Whereas when I tried to lower the stakes to be like, no, it's okay, I'm just writing because I enjoy it and the goal is for me to write a book I'm proud of, suddenly it became more enjoyable. So it's right. the same thing, but like just a different framing that makes it feel no, good. The, pro- the problem is you're not in the Wimbledon finals, but you're fooling yourself into thinking you are. That's where ego comes in and uh, anxiety comes in. You're just, you're just like, you're making it much more than it is. Yeah. Uh, And then you're actually ironically making yourself worse at it. Yes, exactly. You know, the other big one is, um, you know, the idea of power. So we talked about, talk about, talk about in chapter two, Uh, play power and people are like the three main energizers that I found. um, If you shoehorn a bit. Uh, and this idea that um, we get to choose what we're doing. Like, it's you could be doing the same thing, but if you think of it as I have to do this versus I choose to do this, it makes a huge difference to how we personally feel about the thing. Um, I, I really found this a lot when I was when I was working in medicine where, you know, there was one day where um, I, I'd, I'd finished the end of like a 13 hour shift and I was just about to go home to be like, yes, I'm going to go home. And then the nurse was like, hey, Ali, can you put a, an IV, a cannula in this lady in bay number four or whatever it was? And I was like, oh, shit, like this is going to be another half an hour job. It's like the nurse has tried and she couldn't do it. And so this is going to be really hard. And I was just about to go home with 13 freaking hours. I haven't eaten. And then I overheard that some other patient talking about like, oh, it's so nice being in hospital. The doctor has been so nice to me and things. I kind of realized that I'd been falling into that trap of thinking I have to do this thing. 
And I think Seth Godin has a blog post about this that I remembered at the time, which was, you can just reframe that to, I get to do the thing. Sure. So I was like, huh, I get to do this kind of, I get to make this person's morning sickness better so that, you know, her baby's better and that she's better because I was working on, on OBGYN. And it was just like this huge wave of relief that came over me purely as a result of a simple mindset shift of like, have to becomes get to. Well, also, I think one of the things I add to that I, I, is is like important things are hard, right? And so uh, if you are good at something, if you have some sort of calling, mm. um, you're supposed, like, like I, I, I feel like each of us has kind of a unique potential or we get sort of certain opportunities yeah. and with those opportunities comes a kind of an obligation. So like when I hear about someone who is really talented and really good, and then I get the sense that they're just kind of half-assing it mm. or they're stuck or whatever. It's not that I'm judgmental, but I find it to be sad, mm. you know? Like, what do you mean you only wrote one book in 10 years? Like, uh, you're not Robert Caro. You're not like, you're not, you weren't slaving away on some amazing masterpiece. You were just, ill-disciplined and you took the obligations that I think your talent came with, you took, you didn't take them seriously. So I agree, uh, you should mostly be doing what you wanna do, but I also think there's something kind of sad and maybe even pathetic about people who are just like, not unproductive, but, uh, maybe only partially fulfill their potential. Mm. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about this. So you said earlier that, you know, you sometimes ask yourself, am I pushing this book out of laziness or complacency versus like out of a genuine need for balance or something like that? And I was kind of thinking in my mind, like, why does it matter? Like, why, why does it matter to you if you're being la lazy or complacent? You know, you've written like a book a year for the last like 10 years or something absurd <laughs> like that, like, who, well, who I, I think like you have, I, I would argue that we sort of have a higher self and a lower self, hmm. right? And, you know, the lower self says, eh, just like eat whatever you want, uh, work only when you want, um, I don't know, say whatever you want, don't think about consequence. Like there, there's this, the sort of immediate gratification, sort of short term Impul impulses that we all have, right? Mm. That if indulged repeatedly, mm. tend to get us in a place that we actually don't want to be, right? The person, they don't have any friends because they say mean things, right? They're, they feel gross, they look gross, they're not in good health because they don't take good care of themselves. You know, they look back and they go, oh, I wish, you know, I wish that hadn't taken, like if I'd gotten serious about that earlier, I'd have been done sooner, it would have could have done more, could have helped more people, whatever, right? Yeah. So so there's this kind of tension between like our higher self and the lower self. Stephen Pressfield says in between is the resistance, right? And so to me, the question is, is whether I'm, am I, am I doing this because it's the well-adjusted, mature, responsible, you know, right thing to do? Or am I just doing it because the other thing is harder? You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, the other thing is uh, gonna take more out of me and I'm scared or intimidated by that. So I, it's not like I feel like, oh, I have to write these certain number of books so then I'll be remembered forever. Mm. It's just, um, so I just took today off, but what did I get at? Like, what for what reason? Do you know what I mean? Like, so I watched TV all day, I sat around all day. Uh, I have, if 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 I decided not to work because I'm gonna hang out with my family or I'm gonna take a long walk on the beach or I'm gonna read or I'm gonna take care of myself, the, mm. the, that's perfectly fine. That's a part of a, gr a great life. Sure. Um, doing it because I want to watch TV. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't. I don't think that gets I mean, you where you want to go. Some people might argue that watching TV is self care. And so it's like, oh, I didn't work today because I felt, I don't know, stressed or burned out and I needed to watch TV. No, I think if you're doing that, yeah. because if, if that's actually what it is, more power to you. But is is that it or are you lying to yourself? 
So for you, when it comes to like writing more books, well, I'll put it this way. Yeah. Recovery is important, right? Like okay. if you work out, recovery is important. You have to have a certain number of days where you recover. You mm. let the body rest and recuperate. Yeah. Um, is that what you're doing? Or are you just not doing it because it's hard to do? Hmm. It's I'll, always hard to do, right? So, yeah. and the whole point is that it's hard to do. If it was easy to do, there wouldn't be any benefits to it. Right. So, um, you know, are you stopping because you're sensitive to an injury or are you stopping because pretending that you're being sensitive to an, inner, uh, an injury is an excuse to stop? Yeah. Hmm. So I was re rereading um, Bertrand Russell's essay in praise of idleness, um, where he's basically talking about how this you know, this attitude that the modern world inculcates within us, which is that kind of work is inherently meaningful, is like bad and problematic and sure. all that jazz. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm curious for you, like you're presumably planning to write more books because you're fairly young in the grand scheme of things. Um, but like, why? What is the, if, if, if not like, I want to be remembered, I want a legacy, then what's What's, yeah. what's it all in service of? No, he has a great line. He says, uh, the first sign of an impending nervous collapse is the belief that your work is terribly, terribly important. Mm. And I think he's totally right. You know, if you had this sense, like, I'm building this monument, you know, or the world has to experience my genius, uh, this is going to last for a thousand years, you know, uh, that's not that's not only delusional, but like, it's uh, kind of a miserable place to be, and it usually and usually feeds on itself and eventually, you know, wears you down. Um, at this point, I write books that I am interested in writing, like that I find myself better for having done. Hmm. Um, this this book that I just did in the Virtue series, so I did uh, Courage, and I did uh, Discipline, and now I'm doing Justice. I'm almost certain this will be the worst selling book in the series, mm. the Justice one, because it's the least, you know, you talked about certain terms, mm. you know, will perform well. The word well discipline is good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> discipline, like, yeah, obviously, it was, I knew if I did a good job, it would be a home run. Yeah. This one, even if I do the greatest job I possibly can be, possibly can do, you know, it probably has a ceiling on it in some way. But like, I was better for having done it. it I learned something, I articulated something to myself in writing about it. Um, if my kids are the only two people that read it, you know, like I try to, I try to find standards of success or motivations that have become more self-sufficient as I've gone. Yeah. So at this point I write things because creatively I find them interesting yeah. and I love the process of being in the middle of it, even, even when it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, the same thing is true with running. Like I love and I hate running. Like uh, I obviously not doing it is easier than doing it. Yeah. But when I don't do it, I feel worse. Like I feel not in an addictive way, but mm -hmm. I feel when I do it, I feel proud of myself. I feel, uh, physically good i my mind gets in like it it's better that i do it than not do it and there the feeling of being in the middle of a book both the momentum of it and the frustratingness of it it all kind of combines into it just an overall rewarding immersive experience there's th yeah. that's what a flow state is yeah so it sounds like for you writing is the thing that your higher self does and wants to do and therefore is almost a uh, good in its in its own right regardless of how the outcome turns out to be i think so and so you push yourself to write on days even when you don't feel like it it's, it's like going for a run like going to the mm -hmm. gym it's like the thing that you know is good for you that you know is aligned with your own personal values and you don't want to be the sort of guy that's like, you know what, I'm going to skip writing for the next year so I can play more video games kind of vibe. Yeah, one of the Stoics, his name was Musonius Rufus. He says, when you do 
something shameful for pleasure. The pleasure passes quickly, but the shame endures. And then he says, but when you do something hard for good, the effort passes quickly, but the good endures. Oh, nice. And I think that's good. You find whether it's pushing yourself physically, like exercise, it's throwing yourself into a big project, you know, whether it's sacrificing for someone or something, you know, you quickly forget all that it took out of you and all that went into it. And you think about the impact that you had, or you just think about the plane you temporarily ascended to, to get there. And then when you think about, I don't know, the cake that you ate yeah. or, you know, the the off day that you took or the urge that you submitted to afterwards, there's that period where you go, that's what I did all that for, you know, that, that, that five seconds, you know, um, or not even the five seconds, right? And that's the higher, lower self. Hmm. Well, how... So you've recently done a bit of a, well, I wouldn't say pivot, like side hustle on the whole daily dad stuff, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, a lot of, um, I've I, I've been just found, I found myself reading a lot of like parenting advice recently. Uh, I'm not even close to becoming a dad, <laughs> but <laughs> I was just curious. Uh, and I'm part of your daily newsletter on, on that as well, because it's, it's just it's just interesting. But there seems to be this really common thing of like uh, people working hard uh, in their career, sometimes at the expense of their family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you'll hear people say that, like, I thought I was doing my kids a favor by working on and doing this thing and like focusing on my career and stuff. But actually what I maybe should have done in hindsight is to spend less time on my career and more time on the kid stuff. Yeah. How do you think about that balance between like working hard at the thing, but also like being there for the, the, the small ones? Well, it's very insidious because you say I'm doing it all for them. And so you are doing something very selfish, but you are cloaking it in selflessness. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I'm getting on this airplane. That's why I'm staying this late at the office. That's why I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. But if you asked your kids, you know, what do they want? Like more money would be nowhere in that list, right? Or if, if it, if it, was on the list, it would be such a preposterously and refreshingly childlike understanding of money, yeah. you know, that it would, I think it would humble you. So you're, you're saying you're doing it for them, but you're not, you're doing it for you. You're doing it for you. Um, and the tragedy of, of, and the irony of I'm doing it, I'm doing all this for the people I never see mm. is a very sad, fucked up place that a lot of sort of high powered accomplished people find themselves in. Mm. And I heard something great when someone said like, success is your kids wanting to be with you when you're an adult. Uh, and so like, how will you measure your life at the end, right? Um, it won't be like the size of the inheritance that you leave them. It will be, you know, are you still in each other's lives now? So how do you invest in, that's not something you can do later. You know yeah. what I mean? So you have to make those decisions now. That, and they're yeah. and they're costly and uncertain and and um the worst part is you don't even know how much it's costing. I mean, this is obviously much scarier and sort of systemically imposed on women, mm. right? So like you're gonna take three years out of your, you know cumulatively three years out of your working life in your 20s and 30s, which has this enormous cumulative compounding effect on the trajectory that you're going to end up uh, on, you know, that's a very scary thing. Um, and it's, it's, un it's unfair in a lot of ways. Um, but at the end of your life, you know, it's probably going to be something you're glad that you did. Mm. And so I think a lot of men just sort of unthinkingly don't do it at all, but I've, I've tried to sort of go, yeah, what is, what is it that you want to do and who do you want to be? There's this great term, an art monster. I'm forget this female writer. She was saying like, my dream was to be an art monster. Basically just, just me and my work and no family, no, 
you know, uh, no baggage, no impositions, just me. And, and, and it, there are a lot of art monsters and they've written great stuff. But when you read their biographies, you just sort of go, oh, what? You know, uh, was that worth it? You mm -hmm. know, um, and it, it kind of, it kind of taints all of the stuff that they did. It makes it much more bittersweet and not so great. Mm. How did you decide to, you know, go into the dad stuff rather than quit, stay in your lane as the stoic guy? I, I don't know if I really decided it. Um, yeah. I mean, so writing the Daily Dad. I mean, the the reason I decided to do the Daily Dad was that writing the Daily Stoic made me better as a person. I, you can't every single day sit down and try to take insights from the wisest people who ever lived and distill them down into a couple hundred words over and over and over again and not emerge some somewhat bonded to those ideas. Like it just, it gets in your bloodstream, right? Yeah. You're just, that's what stoicism is. Stoic, what Mark Surrealist was doing in his meditations was writing down things. A lot of it comes from other stoic texts. He's just writing it down, rephrasing it and writing it down and writing it down and rephrasing it and looking at it this way and looking, he's having this philosophical discussion with himself. With himself. And that's how Mark Surrealist becomes Mark Surrealist. So, the process of writing the Daily Stoic book and then writing the Daily Stoic every day now for seven years. It's almost a million words that I've published for free uh, to, you know, I think we've done 3,000 Daily Stoic emails. It's like seven or eight books worth of content. Mm -hmm. um, I have benefited from that. Like it's built a business around it, but like if I had made precisely zero dollars, that would have been the bargain of a lifetime, right? Like I've gotten so much better from having done that. And so I just decided that I would do the same thing about parenting. Hmm. And if it helps other people, great. You know, um, if it sells books, great. But the process of having to intentionally sit down and think about and then write about and then publish, you know, how I want to think about these things has made me better. Hmm. And that's how that's how you should think about it. I was I was talking to my wife last night. We were talking about this um, book that we were reading, and um, you know, you get all the way to the end, and you're like, ah, oh, that was good. But actually, you needed in, you needed to read it over like six months, like a couple pages a day. Like, um, I just read this great book by this parenting expert named Dr. Becky Kennedy, um, and so I read it. But then, because I'm going to write about it for Daily Dad, I went through it page by page after and took out all the stuff that I liked. Mm. Um, and it was the second part was where I got stuff out of it, not the reading at once from cover to cover. Mm. And so there's something about the page a day format that's worked in Daily Stoic and Daily Dad. Like if you're trying to absorb a philosophy or a new way of thinking or transform yourself from here to there, it's, it's not 300 pages that you read, yeah. you know, from October 1st to November 17th, you know, that takes you a month and a half to read. It's much better if you're layering it like a page a day for a year or two years or three years and you're coming back, like the process of that sort of over and over and over and over again, that's that's where the stuff gets absorbed. Mm. What are some of the key, um, I guess, you know, from from here to there, like through the course of writing Daily Dad and kind of being a parent, what is what, what are some of the key lessons that have really sort of separated the Ryan today from the Ryan of maybe like three years ago? Um, I think patience. I think like if I'm thinking like the the things I've struggled with most as a parent, but that have also made the most difference. Mm. Uh, number one, like the greatest thing you can give your gift your 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 kids is presence. Like not gifts, but presence, like just actually being there, not doing something else. So, you know, in a digital world, that's extremely difficult to do. Um, so I struggled with that patience, of course. Um, you know, it doesn't happen. It doesn't have to happen quickly. It just has to happen um, to take your time with it, to let them take their time, to not rush things. Mm -hmm. um, every time you think you can't go on like this, that's when you get some sort of breakthrough. Every time you think they're never going to figure it out, that's when they figure it out. So I think mm. patience has been a big one. Um, I've I've read a lot and thought about like sort of how do you just like just root for this person, mm. like not not 
attach any conditions, not attach any judgments, not attach any expectations, but just be an unconditional supporter of them and who they are for who they are and what they are. Um, which I think ties into another idea I've been thinking a lot about, which is like your job is to help your kids become that person, not to make them a person that you want them to be, mm. you know? So to just sort of help them become who they are, that's something I've thought a lot about and worked on a lot. Um, and then the one I've been thinking a lot about, which I heard about in Dr. De Becky's book, obviously I knew about it, but it made sense. But she talks about like, don't try to be a perfect parent, try to be a parent who's really good at repair, like at fixing it when you mess up fixing it when things didn't go the way that you wanted them to go, you know, reconnecting when, you know, there is conflict or when people go in separate directions, but, but repair. So mm. I'd say those are, those are sort of the perennial ones that I struggle with and I'm thinking about. That's very cool. Yeah. I, 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 um, you know, my YouTube channel is, is essentially an exploration of the stuff I'm interested in. And I've recently started to become interested in uh, relationships in terms of reading books about how to have a healthier, happier relationship. Uh, and I I hope that when I become a dad and continue making videos, then I'll be like, yeah, reading all these parenting books and like making a video every every couple of months to be like, right, I've just read the sick, unconditional parenting. Alfie, oh, God, good, good shit. Yeah, yeah. Ten, 10 takeaways. That sort of stuff. I found, I guess, similar to you kind of writing Daily Stoic through me trying to make a video or two every week for six plus years, all personal development adjacent those lessons seep into your <laughs> subconscious in a way that like they really wouldn't yeah. otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Seneca says we learn as we teach. Mm. And so if you as a person who writes self-help books or makes YouTube videos or has pockets or whatever, if you're thinking I'm really smart and I am telling you everything that I know, mm. not only is that egotistical, but it actually continues to inflate and uh, puff up the ego, mm. right? But if instead you see it as like, I am trying to figure things out and I am explaining what I am learning as I am learning it, yeah. you are learning it and other people are learning it and you're creating this feedback loop in which you're both learning at the same time. And by having to articulate it and explain it and distill it, yeah. you are understanding it better than if you were just learning it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, there's a book I'm reading at the moment called uh, Notes from a Fellow Traveler by Darren Brown. He's a mm. magician. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's really into stoicism. I he, he, oh, he's, he is. His yeah. book Happy is very good. It's yeah. basically all about stoicism. Um, but I really like the title of that book, Notes from a Fellow Traveler. Mm -hmm. he's, he's sort of a book written for other magicians. Um, but that framing, like a fellow traveler, I really mm -hmm. like that. Because he's not trying to be a guru. He's not saying I've got the answer. He's just like, hey, I'm in this business just as you are. And here are some notes. Mm -hmm. and I just love that framing of it. It just takes takes all the pressure off, reduces the seriousness, makes it feel more like play, all of, all of the good things. Yeah, someone who's just a little bit further along the path in some ways or struggling with their own things mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're sort of channeling that and trying to make it accessible and practical to other people. What is uh, what are some like I I really like this list of the the, the parenting some things. Do you have any uh, on relationships in general like <laughs> Uh, like the romantic relationship with your wife and things. What are some things that you guys do that maybe you've discovered through reading and stuff? That well, I always say that the number one... So I've been with my wife now for 17 years. We we met when we were in college. And um, we, uh, we met at a college party. We got married almost 10 years ago. Mm. I think it's eight years this year, nine years. So it's been a long time. So it's, uh, And we've basically been married that whole time. Uh, in that we always had a, a very sort of involved, like serious relationship as opposed to just, we've known each other a long time. Yeah. Um, and so people sometimes ask what the secret to like, a, you know, lasting that long is. And I usually say that the, the secret is to not break up. That's the secret. That's the, the number one secret is to just not break up. Um, because I, I, I'm joking, but I'm also not joking, right? Like I think, just as a productivity system or a business or a lifestyle, mm. whatever, it, it's about picking a thing and then sticking with that thing, yeah. right? Um, through the ups and downs of what life inevitably brings you. Mm. And I find, you know, obviously we got together before online dating was really even a thing, but then 
dating apps and like I noticed that a lot of my friends struggle because it's easy to break up and it's easy to find another person. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like essentially an unlimited amount of other fish in the sea exist. Mm. And if you conceive of that, it makes it very hard to do what a relationship requires. Mm. You know what I mean? Which is sacrifice, which is struggle, which is putting up with shit, mm. you know? So it's hard. It's like, it's really hard. It's hard. Uh, so I, I uh, profess to have no no secrets other than don't quit. Uh, I mean, it's it's amazing how in, in all these different spheres, like, you know, the stuff you were talking about with kids, presence, patience, rooting without conditions, judgments, expectations, being repair and not being perfect. All of that stuff applies to uh, every other aspect of life as well, like work too. Well, even the kid stuff applies yeah. to yourself, right? Because we all have sort of, we all have this inner child that needs work, mm. right? That's stuck somewhere, not fully developed. Mm. And one of the beautiful things about having kids is the way that it allows you to reparent yourself because yeah. you suddenly fully understand what a six-year-old is going through mm. or a nine-year-old is going through or a nine-month-old is going through. And you can see more clearly now the things that you didn't get that maybe you needed mm. um, or the ways that how everyone used to do things was insufficient. Um, maybe just for you specifically or maybe just as a practice it was terrible. And you can kind of see, oh, okay. I can't go back in time and fix that, but I can do things differently here. And I can also empathize connect with an earlier version of myself that needed those things too. And that by giving that thing to someone else, you're also partly healing yourself. That's great stuff. Um, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, what are some of the secrets to <laughs> stay, staying in good shape <laughs> as I, you've you know, been, been, a, been a parent? I possess to have, profess to have no <laughs> secrets there either, other than I try to run, swim, or bike every day. I yeah. just try to do some hard, strenuous physical activity every day. Hmm. Um, and if there is a health benefit to that, I consider it a bonus hmm. on top of the two real benefits that having an exercise practice gives you. One, you are literally practicing having a practice. Like every day I go for a run. Hmm. The default is that I do the thing. And every time I do the thing, I am building the muscle of, of doing the thing and being the kind of person that does what I say I'm going to do. Yeah. Like, it's not fun to do it. It can hurt to do it. But I get up off the couch and I do the thing that I say I'm going to do. Mm. And the second benefit of having a physical practice is that it's usually getting the mind moving in some way. Uh, and so, you know, there's no screens, there's no multitasking. You're just in mm. that headspace. So like mm. I have the, I have the, the flow state every day from the physical activity and the days when I don't have it, nothing else is as works as well. Mm. Do you do any weight training or? Yeah, I try to lift weights like, I don't know, a couple of times a week. I feel like I've seen some B-roll of you in like the backyard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have like kettlebells or I have like a squat rack. Like I do yeah. some stuff. Not as, uh, In the pandemic, I got more into it than I do now. The important thing for me is I run, swim, or bike. Like I do some form of cardio exercise for a long period of time. Mm. And then if I can get the other stuff in, sure. Changing gears a bit. Um, I was re-listening to the conversation we had three years ago in the car on the way here. Um, and the, w w one of the things you said in that has actually stayed with me for the last three years. It was something to the effect of, you know, you've got all these friends who are in real estate and sometimes you're like, huh, maybe I should get into real estate. And then you realize all your friends want to be self-help book writers <laughs> and you're like, huh, I've got a pretty good gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you can just sort of like riff on that for, <laughs> for a sec. Seneca had this word, euthymia which he defines as tranquility. He says, tranquility is the sense of the path that you are on and not being 
distracted by the paths that crisscross yours. He says, especially from those who are hopelessly lost, which I think is very beautiful and true. Sometimes you find like when you're running, you know, someone will pass you and you go, are they faster than me? They could have started eight seconds ago and you could be five miles in or they could be stronger than you. They could be doing steroids. You know, like there's unli- the idea that you're comparing yourself to this person when you don't know when they started and you don't know where they're finished, finishing is madness, mm. right? Um, and life is like that. Like we're all running our own races and you've got to have a sense of the race that you are running and what victory or success in that race is to you. So I think that's like the number one life lesson and something I, I remember learning I'd run around this track in college and I would sometimes catch myself picking up my pace to keep up with someone else. And then they would stop. And I'm like, I just gassed myself, you know, now I have to cut the run short because I was competing with this person and I have no idea what their goals are, what they're doing. I, I know nothing about them other than someone competition, you know, and it, it sucks you in. So I think that's a really important lesson that I've learned from the physical practice over the years. But one of the things about jealousy or you know, sort of envy, the sort of competitive urge that we feel in other parts of our lives is that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about who that other person is, what their life is like, uh, and what they want. You know, Marcus really says like these, the people whose approval you, you crave, he says, take a minute to think about who they really are and whether, and see what that does to the approval you want from them. Right. It's like, you just go, oh, this person has this. I want to be like them, or I want to be accepted into that group. I want to be in this club. And you're not really thinking about who those people are, what they do, whether it's working for them. And I've had this surreal sort of experience pertaining to that where you meet people and you think they have it all Mm. and then you know you're jealous of them and then it turns out they're jealous of you right like you you jealousy almost always takes for granted what you have because it's you know eyeing what someone else has Mm. and there's usually a an ignorance of would you actually, what, what is it actually like to be that other person? And I've, yeah, I found, it's funny, you meet, I meet these billionaires or whatever, and uh, what do they actually want to do? They want to write books. Like they, they have all the money in the world and what are they trying to spend the money on? They're trying to spend it on having the thing that I get to do. And mm-hmm. uh, so I, I try to remind myself of that and count myself as lucky to get to do this. Do you feel that sense of comparison or, or do you slash did you ever feel that sense of comparison when it comes to uh, bestseller lists and book sales numbers and uh, James Clear has got this many five-star reviews on Amazon and I've only got this many five-star, you know, that, that whole shebang. <laughs> well, that's why it's important to understand what race you're running, right? Yeah. So um, I remember I was at a conference in Canada. I don't remember. I was at some conference and James, who was... Uh, then he had this popular newsletter and I sort of vaguely knew his work. We talked a couple of times. I was doing a panel or a, a session on publishing mm. and he came and he asked for a bunch of advice, but he was just generally, if I remember correctly, quite skeptical about why anyone would traditionally publish or publish a book at all. He's like, why would I do this? I have this huge email newsletter. Why wouldn't I just write stuff on the internet? And I th- I said, look, people have read books for thousands of years. It's a It's a medium that has a certain cultural significance and books are actually a great way to deliver ideas, right? But there I was a person who'd published, you know, a few successful books at that point. And I'm sort of like condescendingly telling this internet writer why publishing should, uh, you know, be something that he considers. And then a couple of years later, he puts out a book and that one book has sold more than all of my books combined and then some. (laughs) So... (laughs) You know, the one reaction to that would just be jealousy, yeah. scorn, sinister. Like you could, you that could make you feel shitty. Yeah. And I think there are times in my life when maybe that would have made me feel shitty. Mm. But first off, I, I like James. Second, I think he's a great writer, and I think Atomic Habits is actually a very good book. Mm. And third, 
I don't know how many I'm counting now, but whatever. <laughs> there is no universe in which that book selling more or less copies affects my life in any negative or positive way, yeah. right? Like, so that book could sell a hundred million copies. Mm. It, they're not, it's not coming out of my pocket, mm. right? So more power to them, right? Um, and so I've tried to remind myself of that. But then what I, I've, you have to do when you realize you're running your own race mm. is you have to go, James is writing a book about habits, which is for everyone. Mm. I am writing about an obscure school of ancient philosophy, mm. which I would like to be for everyone, but by definition is probably going to be for fewer people. And that is a choice that I made willingly. Mm. I can write about whatever I want. I could have written about whatever I want. I chose this thing or this thing chose me because it's the right thing for me. And you have to be able to go, ah, right. This is where I'm supposed to be. I made a series of choices and for better or for worse, those choices made some outcomes possible mm. and some outcomes not possible. Like I remember I spoke to these uh, high ranking officers in the Navy once a couple of years ago and I was talking about ego or something. And I said, you know, like if you got into this for like money and recognition and fame, you fucked up. Like you shouldn't have joined the Navy. Like you joined this because there were certain parts of it that lit you up, that were meaningful to you, that you thought were the right fit for you. You chose classical music, not pop music, yeah. right? And by nature of making that choice, some outcomes are possible and some outcomes are not possible. And you have to accept that. And the worst thing you can do is make those choices which are objective and a sort of unbeatable and then work really hard and expect things that are in contradiction of that choice. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. if you're a classical musician and you go, my goal is to be the best classical musician I can be and to push the boundaries of the blah, 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 then you can succeed. If you go, I'm putting out this album and I hope it debuts at number one on the billboard charts, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're almost surely going to be severely disappointed mm. <laughs> because you've chosen something that is a smaller pool. You know, maybe you have a higher floor, but a lower ceiling. That's the nature of the choice that you mm. made. And being honest with yourself about that is really, really important, mm. at least for happiness. Yeah. Do you ever meet writers who you feel have uh, sort of this unhealthy relationship with comparison? Is it like, or are most of the people you hang out with fairly enlightened? No, no. I mean, definitely there's people that are, you know, sort of driven by how much they sell or yeah. how much money they make or whatever. But again, if that's why you got into books, you fucked up. You know what I mean? Like if you got into writing books for money and fame and power, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, like there's, <laughs> that's not even, that's like, that's probably the worst of all the different genres of entertainment or show business. Yeah, You pick the worst one. Like for that, if that's what you're optimizing for, you pick the worst one. Um, so to expect, like the Stokes say, don't expect figs in winter. That's like the essence of happiness is to not expect figs in winter. There's a time when you can get figs and it's not winter. Um, so, you know, you can be successful writing books. You can make uh, a good amount of money. You can make more money than you need. Mm. But are you going to rival the fortune of Warren Buffett? No. You know, so to expect otherwise is probably silly. It's not even probably silly. It's stupid. Nice. It's stupid. <laughs> and it's not fair. It's not fair to you or to the people around you, right? Because you are feeling aggrieved that you didn't get something that it was not possible ever to get. So my book is coming out in at the end of December. So I'm not sure when this is going to be aired, but end of December. Uh, any advice? <laughs> it's the first one. <laughs> Um, you've been been through this a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I always tell people when they finish a book yeah. that you have completed the first of two marathons. Hmm. And you you finish this first marathon and you think, you know, you're like, oh, you stagger across the finish line. <laughs> and, and you think there, someone grabs you by the hand and you think that they're going to take you over 
to like the metal stand. Yeah. And instead they're just leading you over to the starting line of the second marathon, which is now marketing and selling the book, mm. talking about it and getting it into people's hands. Yeah. And so understanding that these are two equally important races, um, I think is really, really important. And not enough people do that. They just write something and then they just expect or assume that the world owes them success, which it doesn't. Mm. People are busy. People have a lot going on. There's not only all the books that are coming out, but there's literally everything that has ever been published for all of human history up until this point. And a lot of it is very good. And most people haven't even gotten to a fraction of that. So the idea that your thing is going to jump in front of that line is inherently yeah. <laughs> presumptuous, if not delusional. And so it takes a lot of work to break through. You know, the obstacle is the way when it came out. First off, I said to myself, I'm writing a book about ancient philosophy. And most people are not interested in ancient philosophy. Yeah. So it's already an uphill battle. Hmm. And then I said to myself, I read a lot. How many books do I read the week they come out? Or the month they come out? Or the year they come out? And I read way more than most people. Mm. How many books have I pre-ordered ever in my life? Maybe one or two? <laughs> so the idea that this thing is going to come out of the gates as a hit mm. is stupid. You know, It's going to take a long time. So first off, you try to make something that doesn't need doesn't have an expiration date on it. That's number one. Mm. Number two, seeing it as a marathon and not a sprint. It's really, really important. So The Obstacles Away came out in May of 2014. Mm. I had started writing it in 2012. So it took mm. two years, came out. It sold three, 4,000 copies its first week. It got skunked on the New York Times bestseller list. Like, and, skunked, yeah, like yeah. It, it should, it, it probably sold enough to hit the what was then the extended list. Yeah. There was twenty spots on the advice how to then, yeah. and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And it certainly sold enough to hit the Wall Street Journal hardcover business list. And uh, someone at my publisher had decided to list it as a like a different, like it didn't qualify for that list. Mm -hmm. Like they categorized, they checked the box, yeah. categorized it something <laughs> different, didn't hit it. Yeah, so. It did not hit any bestseller list until September of 2019. Wow, nice. At which point it had sold close to a million copies. Um, so again, we think like, you know, we think of what a bestseller is. We forget that bestseller lists are categorized by the week. Mm. So a book that sells 10,000 copies in one week will hit a bestseller list for that week, almost certainly. Mm. But a book that sells 1,000 copies a week for a year, sell five times as many copies, but almost certainly not make any bestseller list. Mm. And which would you rather have? Mm. Um, and so it's about setting yourself up to last, and it's about not quitting on it. Nice. Um, and The Obstacles Way sells, most years sells more copies than it did the previous year, which is you know pretty rare in publishing. Mm -hmm. But every single week that comes out, it, that it is out, how many copies it sold in its first week becomes less and less important, mm. right? And yeah. unless you are not successful, <laughs> that will be true for your project, mm. right? Like every week, the percentage of how you did at the beginning- Becomes more and more meaningless. Yeah. Becomes more and more meaningless. But that's nice. very hard to think about when you, when it is 100% of the weeks yeah. that you have been out, right? Um, takes time. Mm -hmm. and, and realizing that when I, the thing I've try, I tried to say to myself is um, the, to people who have never heard of you, you are new. So I, I'll probably almost certainly have an email in my inbox when I get done from this from someone and say, I just read your book, The Obstacles Away, that is approaching its 10 year anniversary, yeah. right? And so to them, it's a brand new book. Hmm. And it's a brand new book to them because they're a junior in high school, yeah. you know? 
and they were eight when it came out, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so, you know, that's what sort of lasting can do. Um, and to, and to, yeah, to, to sort of be, be patient with it is the main, is the main thing. One of the we so we we have a telegram group for our podcast and we said we were gonna, gonna interview you and we had like loads of people asking loads of questions there's one comment from one guy that i felt a bit salty about he was like ryan holiday says the same stuff on every podcast he's interviewed on and i was like hmm because i also i i say the same stuff on every podcast i'm interviewed on and it's like it's kind of like a thing you have to do and uh, like i i found that it was it was less a comment on you and, and more like I started thinking, fuck, you know, I've, I've made the same video so many times. I've talked, been talking about productivity for like six plus years now. I've basically been saying the same stuff. But there, each, year, each month we get like 100,000 new subscribers. So it's clearly new to someone. Yeah, there's some main <laughs> character energy in, in people who don't realize that um, yeah. <laughs> most people are consuming this thing for the first time and hearing about this person for the first time. Mm. So, you know, as a creator, there's a little bit of narcissism in that you go like, everyone's following everything that I do. Mm. And in fact, not only does most people not know that you exist, even the people that know you exist and are fans, you're like 500th on their list of priorities. Mm. Like I think about my favorite bands, my favorite authors, like how closely am I following their life? Mm. Like, not at all. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I have main character, character energy in my own life. Yeah. So realizing that like, that self-consciousness can actually hold you back as a creator because mm. you're like, they'll people will get mad that I just talked about this two videos ago. Mm. And actually they didn't see two videos ago, so you're not. But um, the other product of this is, is the other part I would say to that person that's a little tricky is it's like, dude, it's not my fault. Like I can only answer the questions that I'm yeah. being asked. <laughs> and I tend to get asked the same questions a lot, right? What is this? <laughs> so, so, so like I would love to be, I would love to have a totally new and unique conversation every time. And I do, I, I definitely feel like there are ones where I'm like, that, that was interesting to me for a change. I didn't feel like I was yeah. sort of, you know, uh, giving the same song and dance. But a lot of people are just asking the same questions because they're introducing you to their audience or they yeah. want to get the, the basics. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's, it can be weird. Do you ever go, get bored writing about stoicism? Um, not really. Uh, because one of the ideas from the Greeks is this idea that we don't step in the same river twice because the river changes and you change. And so, I mean, I've been doing the Daily Stoic email every day for seven years and I've probably used some of the same quotes hundreds of times at this point, but it feels new to me every time I do it because what I'm trying to say or the way into the idea is different. And I know the audience is different and I know what's happening in the world is different. Mm -hmm. So it, it keeps, it, it certainly keeps me, it feels fresh to me because life is fresh. Mm. Um, but when I am bored, I just write about whatever I want. You know, like it isn't the only thing that I do. Uh, and so when I feel like writing something, I write that thing. Hmm. Yeah, because people sometimes ask me that, you know, are you bored, aren't you bored of talking about productivity? I'm like, honestly, not really. Like I'm bored of, I guess, making videos that are like top 10 productivity tools. <laughs> but I do very little of that these days. And I think productivity is, you know, really just about using our time well, which covers basically everything in personal mm -hmm. development. And <laughs> so even if I'm writing about relationships or making a video about health, I would count that as productivity. Yeah, but but also, you know, productivity to you when you were in medical school is different than what productivity is to you now as yeah. you are not in medicine. It's different to you when you had one employee, it's different to you when you had 10. Mm. You know, it what you're going through and where you're applying it is fundamentally different. Mm. So even if you're talking about the same ideas, you have a larger sense of it, you have a larger set of experiences to draw from. And so even if it is the same, it's it's better and different yeah. because it's based on more. Why do you think people are so interested in passive income? <laughs> oh, I'm really interested in passive income. <laughs> does it exist? I, I think it does. Um, 
So there's this the, the, this whole dream. I, I'm I'm not sure if if Tim Ferriss used the phrase in the Four Hour Work Week or if it was a thing afterwards. But I remember reading that book when I was like 17 and just about to four apply. Four Hour Work Week. Yeah, and just like just about to apply to medical school, and my mind just absolutely blew wide open at the the thought that I could be making money while I slept, hmm. and just that thing of like you know was always always in the back of my mind. And now we know it's, it's it's another one of those things that anytime we make a video on YouTube uh, with the with the phrase passive income in it, we know it's going to do well because people love the idea of of doing a thing and then it making money without needing your additional input. I think mm. kind of like books. Books are a source of passive income. Yeah, well, intellectual property. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, you wrote the obstacles away ten years ago, <laughs> or, sure. and it's now been making you passive income ever since. Um, I've certainly found in our business. Um, the stuff that I, I I get so much satisfaction out of seeing like a, a Stripe notification that someone bought a course I filmed three years ago mm-hmm. and I've made $149 from sure. it. And way less satisfaction making way more money on a sponsored video. Because <laughs> there's sure. something about it being an asset that is spinning off, I guess, free money that is like really nice. And also, I guess, it really appeals to other people. <laughs> yeah, I guess that makes sense. I was talking to an internet marketer person that I knew and, you know, it, it, like, let's say he was saying like the email subject line, like follow the strategy to make $1,000 a month or to make thousands of dollars a month would actually perform worse than say like this strategy helps me make $1,444 and 17 cents per month. Like the spec, he was saying like the specificity of it, yeah. even if it was total nonsense, mm. resonated, resonated with people more. Um, and I always wondered what, there's something, naive is not the wrong, right word, maybe unsophisticated is a nicer way to say it, about the idea that you, if you just do all this stuff, at some point you won't have to do anything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because that's not really how life works in my experience. Yeah, no, it's not really how life works. Um, nor is it how you would actually, nor is it how the life works for most of the people that you admire. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like people who do stuff that you're like, that's cool. I want to be like that are not people who own a series of vending machines that passively make money while they sleep. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? They're people who are actively engaged in what they do. Yeah, I guess. Um, I th- So I've 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 kind of gone back and forth on this whole passive income thing. Um, we st- we still make videos about passive income, and I always do a whole like twenty minutes of philosophizing at the start to be like, okay, here's how money works. Money is an exchange of value. Blah 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 blah. blah. Um, but I find that like if I think back to myself back when I was in medical school, the thought of being able to if I if someone gave me a vending machine business and yeah. it was making three thousand a month, I'm like, whoa! I never need to work a day in my life now. Now I can now I can do what I really want to do. Um, sure. And just that co- being able to cover the basics through some sort of automated income stream, even if it's not like greatness or anything, even if it's just like, I don't know, automated vending machine selling Coke cans or like a T-shirt business or whatever the thing is. I think that is the, that is still very appealing <laughs> because then it's like, cool, the bases are now covered. I can now spend my time doing the things that I I actually want to do. I get that. Yeah, I I, I, I thought about... I thought it, about it that way earlier in my career. I mean, first of all, I had a job as mm-hmm. I was becoming a writer, which allowed me to make certain creative decisions that yeah. maybe if I was a starving artist, I wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have had the luxury of being able to turn things down or doing things a certain way or having as much time. But then, yeah, I thought, I, it was like, I don't have a trust fund, but if I have sort of income streams other than like the creative work that I yeah. do, it's like I gave myself a trust fund. Yeah, and now I have a certain amount of freedom or independence that I wouldn't if I was living and dying by how yeah. single paycheck. <laughs> yes, or or till I burned through the book advance or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, honestly, like there, and anytime I make one of these money themed videos, there are always some comments that say, "Oh, I can't believe you're so obsessed with money. Like, stop talking about money all the time." Or like, oh, this guy's such a, so greedy and, and stuff. But I'm always like, no, like having having more than one stream of income is genuinely life changing. Yeah. Like the fact that I had money coming in from my YouTube channel and my business meant that I could leave my day job or at least go part time on it to focus on the thing that actually brought me joy and fulfillment. 
being able to have an extra stream of income is what allows parents to spend more time with their kids. Sure. It's like one of the most worthwhile things in the world to have if you care about personal freedom and fulfillment and stuff. Um, and so I was sort of, I feel, I feel a bit distasteful of the, of the phrase passive income, yeah. but I almost view, view it as a bit of a, a, a Trojan horse into kind of teaching people that like, hey, you know, the way you actually make money is by creating X amount of value and capturing Y percent of it. Yeah. Now just figure out a way that you can do that that's not correlated with your time. Generally by creating something that's like media or code or basically those two things. <laughs> yeah, or investments yeah. or... Oh, yeah, yeah, or money itself, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people talk about like, you know, I want to earn like fuck you money. Mm. But really you could just have enough to be like, eh. You know, or like, I don't need to. Yeah. Or, you know, I, just just enough that it can it can kind of help you swing you one way or another as you're thinking about making a decision. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Uh, whereas if your livelihood is dependent on this thing entirely. It's really hard to. I think about like, I mean, obviously you're not American, but in, in America, the fact that for most people, their health insurance is tied up. Yeah, that's so unfair. Job. It's the <laughs> oh dumbest, it's, especially as a country that celebrates entrepreneurialism and risk-taking. Yeah. It seems like the most basic thing in the world that you would want to separate those two things so mm. people could take bigger risks and bet on themselves and do like you shouldn't think I could literally die yeah. if I leave my job. That's madness to me. But being able to go, hey, actually I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to see where this thing takes me mm. and I know I'm not going to starve. Like I know that I have this thing and maybe it's not covering my full expenses like you know what i mean like i yeah. i have these things that allow me like when i when i did the obstacles the way my publisher offered me about half of what i'd gotten paid for my first book so if i didn't have my day job um i probably i don't know if i would have said yes mm. um but i it, i wasn't indifferent to money but i was able to go i really don't care what the amount is what i care about is are you going to publish this book? Because if you are, then I'm going to go all in on this thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and so having, I, I do see how that gives you, gives you a certain amount of freedom of movement. Mm. Yeah, I think it, like even like even in the UK. So obviously, like health insu your health insurance is not tied to your employment, and yeah. the National Health Service is very good. But even then, people still act as if quitting their job means that they're going to die. Yes. And I'll often speak to people who, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, back in the day, I was a bit concerned that, oh, if I leave medicine, will people think, oh, fuck you, I don't want to listen to your content anymore. Uh, but it's actually kind of the opposite's happened. People are like, oh, man, you got out of the system. You like, I don't know, something about the matrix and, and stuff. So people keep ask, ask, ask me for advice around quitting their job all the time. They're like, yeah, I really want to leave my job and do this thing. I'm like, great, what's stopping you? They're like, oh, but like, you know, the paycheck. And I'm like, okay, are you on the poverty line where like this paycheck is actually meaningful? that is a difference between survival and not. I'm like, nope. Have you got any dependents? Nope. These are all people in their 20s yeah. that have a safety net from their parents. And yet still the thought I might quit fall behind yeah. and like fall behind my friends who are then getting that promotion at McKinsey or whatever the thing might be is preventing people from making a decision that is very unlikely to regret. <laughs> so I try and like nudge that as much as possible. Well, I, I got so lucky when I dropped out of college since I, I've talked about this before, but when I went in there, I was like, I'm here to drop out of college. <laughs> nice. And they were like, what? Mm. You know, uh, they're like, just fill out this form. You take out, you're, you're just taking an indefinite leave of absence. You can mm. come back whenever you want. There were some consequences. Like I, I remember I was signing, I signed something and it was like, your scholarship may not be here when you're back. As an adult now, I realize they probably just would have given it to me again. But like, so there, it wasn't totally without cost, but it, there was the idea that like, I thought it was this permanent irrevocable lifestyle decision mm. when in fact it was a pause and you think hey i'm gonna leave this to go do this i'm gonna go give this a try i'm gonna open this coffee shop and you think you can never go back yeah and of course you can go back if you were in the hospital for a year would you be sitting there going i can never go back to my job no you would know there's gonna it's gonna be an adjustment period i might have some ketchup i have to you know there's but you, you just go get another job. Mm. Like that's how life works, right? And, but especially when you're younger and you don't have the experience, it feels like the shift or the transition or the, the quitting 
can never be undone. Mm. And only with yeah. time you realize that the stakes were so much lower than you thought they were. Yeah. Yeah, I find the the Tim Ferriss fear setting exercise mm -hmm. to be just yeah, really what's helpful. What's actually the worst case scenario yeah. here? What's the worst case? And it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what does it look like? How could you mitigate against it? Let's say the worst case does happen. What can you do to come back to where you currently are or at least some place that's good enough? Um, I think I've done that like three or four times in my life at the sort of crux of making a big decision. And I've always been like, oh, this is really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> the worst case is never as bad as we think it is. And recovering from the worst case is also never as hard as we initially think it's going to be. Yeah, I remember when I was thinking of dropping out, I was talking to this person and, and he was telling me I should do it. And I go, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out? You know, and he, he was like, when I was in college, he was like, I got mono or something. He, he got something and he, he spent a year recovering. Yeah. And he's like, do you know how many times this has come up in my life <laughs> that it took me five years to graduate from college? Zero times. Nobody knows. Nobody even does the math. You started college at this date. You got your first, like, nobody knows. Yeah. It just, it, as more time goes by, it just all, go, like, you spent your time in college, now you're not in college. Mm -hmm. No one's like, oh, but what about that year between your sophomore and your junior year? What was that about? It, yeah. it never comes up. And his point was like, if I take this risk and it doesn't work out, I just go back and it takes you four years to graduate, five years to graduate, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a rounding error in mm. the big scheme of things. There's a good, I think it's, it's, it's this thing that Jeff Bezos says, um, which is like, you know, he's, ta he's talking about the kind of the game of entrepreneurship. And he's sort of likening it to a baseball match. And he's like, normally in a baseball match, you can either hit one to four runs or whatever the number is. I don't know anything about baseball. But he's like, in entrepreneurship, you can take a swing, but like the upside of the swing is infinite. Yes. And so if you take enough swings, you can actually get a, an outcome that way outperforms what you could have done if you were doing the job thing, sure. for example. Um, and I think the, you know, I, I, I wish more people would appreciate the asymmetry of the upside that you get from taking a risk and doing your own thing potentially. Yeah. Right. So you, you, you understand and you articulate the downside, which is less than you think. Mm. And then it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that the upside could literally be incomprehensible. Incompre like yeah. when Jeff Bezos starts Amazon, he has some idea mm. that it could be successful, Yeah, but it would have been literally impossible to conceive of what it became. Yeah because it didn't exist yet. And when I left, I had this sense that I wanted to be a writer. And I knew that I thought leaving got me closer, a better chance of being that writer than staying. Mm. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but like the, the writing that I ended up doing and the level at which I ended up doing it would have been, if I thought that's what I was doing, I should have been certified. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like I would have, been a sign of a mental illness. Like the, any sense that this is how it was going to go. Yeah, you know what I mean. So you're just taking it step by step. Yeah, I think the the other big thing that I found really helpful was, you know, back in Jeff's day, we where there were very few examples of what does entrepreneurship look like. Like these days, no one like people don't have that excuse anymore. Yeah. Like if someone want, is even entertaining the thought of being a writer. There are a zillion interviews with professional writers out there. Sure. If someone's been an entrepreneur, there are a zillion interviews with entrepreneurs where they're literally talking about how much money they're making. Yeah. Similarly for YouTube and stuff. Um, and so surrounding, I think an in information diet is a really important part of this. Yes. Like even just watching videos, reading books and listening to podcasts from people who are doing the thing that you think you want to do helps you realize that, oh, that's a fair, fairly normal. They've just been doing it for a while and oh, yeah. that's this what the outcome could look like. Yeah, like look, if you're... No one, no one goes. It must be impossible to be an accountant. How does someone become an accountant, mm -hmm. right? Because you accountants are everywhere, right? Although you know, if you grew up in the inner city and your parents didn't work and you never had, it might actually seem utterly unattainable and yeah. impossible to become that thing. And the reality is, it's not. People do it every fucking day, mm. and. That's not to say it's easy, but it is possible. It's very possible. And if you steep yourself in how possible it is and surround yourself, not physically, but intellectually with people who have done it, mm. you figure out how it can be done. And you know, we talk a lot these days about like Nepo babies and nepotism. I think so much of that is if your mom was a famous actress, sure, that gives you advantages and introductions and you're in this sort of milieu that's beneficial, but yeah. also 
that doesn't seem impossible or impractical because mm. your mom is doing it. She's not that great. <laughs> do you know what I mean? She's like, you know, you're just like, people do this. It yeah. is a job. You see how it works. It's yeah. deconstructed and demystified for you in a way that allows you to go, to give yourself that self-assignment. Like I could do that. Mm. Yeah, it was the same for me with the medicine stuff. Like I didn't have any in any official advantage getting into med school, but my both my parents are doctors. All of my friends' parents are doctors. <laughs> Basically everyone I knew growing up was a doctor. Yeah. And so like, it doesn't seem that hard. People become doctors. People become doctors. It's, it's, and then, you know, it was only when I started applying to med school and stuff where some people, oh my, oh my God, you're applying to med. Wow, that's so hard. Is it? Is it? <laughs> like everyone I know is a doctor. Like sure. it's, it's not that big a deal. Um, I think it's that same concept applied to, yeah, anything. So people will probably be listening to this towards the end of the year mm. where they start thinking of habits and resolutions. If someone's like, I want to be more productive next year, yeah, what would you tell them? Oh, if someone wants to be more productive next year. All right, I've got, I've got three, three things. Number one is actually just figure out or at least make a rough first draft of where do you actually want to go? Like, sure, you can be more productive by cranking out more words per day or whatever, but like, if you're not trying to be a writer. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Like Don't have a vague sense of yeah. what, pr productivity is not a goal. Exactly. Yes. Productivity is like a, sort of an effectiveness measurement en route to a particular goal. And if you don't have that goal, then optimizing for productivity is completely pointless. Yeah. So I think step one is to figure out what the goal is. You know, some people don't like the word goal. Um, the, the most helpful exercise I've, I've ever found for this is uh, something called the Odyssey Plan from the book Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett is, and this other guy who's like some Stanford professors. Uh, and basically the idea is that you imagine your life three to five years in the future if you continued down your current path and you write out what it would look like. Then you go back to, back to day one, back to today, and you imagine your life three to five years from now if you had to take a completely different path. And then you go back. And then you imagine your life three to five years from now if you had to take a completely different path but money was no object and you didn't care about what people thought of you. And that just gives you sort of this divergent thinking that most people just never do. And I, I personally enjoy like doing that exercise every year and then converting it into a, okay, what does my 12 month celebration look like? 12 months from now, what would I like to be celebrating in the different realms of life, health, work, relationships, joy? Those are the four that I like personally. Sure. And now I've got some goals written down. And there's so much evidence that says that people who write down goals, <laughs> the eight people who have goals, are way more productive than people who don't. And people who write them down are even way more productive than people who don't write them down. So step one, figure out what your goals are and just write them down. Step two, I find it super helpful to just convert all of those goals into what is the action I have to take each week. So, so if you're, for example, trying to write a book, it might be a daily action of writing for two hours a day or a thousand words or whatever the thing might be. In my case, I'm trying to get fit. And so weight training three times, three times a week is the habit or the system I'm trying to develop. Um, and then number three is putting all those things in the calendar. <laughs> oh, and then if they're in the calendar and you can turn you and you can make yourself the sort of person that does what's in the calendar. Honestly, that is like 95% of all of all of the world's productivity advice condensed into three <laughs> things. Figure out where you want to go, turn it into and figure out how you're going to get there and then just put it in the calendar and do the thing when it comes around. With a fresh year coming, what would you recommend people stop doing? Like what's a what's like a a destructive habit that you would say to get rid of? That's a really good question. What do people stop doing? Um, a really big one that holds everyone back is <laughs> overthinking. <laughs> um, so much research from this book uh, around procrastination was realizing that procrastination is primarily an emotional problem. Um, there is some sort of kind of fear of looking bad, fear of failure, self-doubt, uh, the mind starts to weave all these stories about how we're not good enough to do this particular thing. And, you know, I've, I've interviewed a couple of kind of procrast professors in procrastination who've done all the research about this. And their their whole thing is like, you've just got to find a way to cut through the bullshit that the mind will present to, present to you and just make a start on the thing. And often procrastination is a problem with getting started because once we get started, 
the inertia means that we'll just continue going. It's way harder to... Right, objects in motion yeah. tend to continue. Exactly. Motion, Newton's yeah. first law. Yeah, we talk about that in chapter four of the book. <laughs> um, so the, recognizing that has, has really helped me recognize that when the mind is getting in the way, the best thing I can do is just get started with the thing. Mm. And then the mind has a habit of just sort of getting out of the way. But if people can stop overthinking and stop letting this fear of self-doubt and failure and stuff get in the way, getting in the way of living their best life, I would love that. I would love for that to happen. All right, last question. What's something you feel like the Stoics can teach a person who wants feel-good productivity? Yeah, I think the the main one I always come back to is the dichotomy of control. Um, Epictetus, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there are some things that are within our control and there are other things that are not within our control. And any amount of worrying about the things that are not within our control is usually worry that it's wasted. And I think a big part of feel-good productivity is find a way to control the things that you can control. You know, a huge part of what drives intrinsic motivation is the sense of autonomy, sense of control, the sense that we have power over what we're doing. And some people are like, well, you know, I don't have any control over what my boss tells me to do. I was like, okay, you might not have control over the, the specific thing you have to do, but you might have control over how you choose to approach it. You have control over the process. Can you find a way to make it more interesting? Can you find a way to speed it up? Can you find a way to slow it down? Can you find a way to, I don't know, add music in the background to make it more interesting? There is always control that we can take in basically every situation, even in situations where we feel like we have none. Mm. And there's that quote from Viktor Frankl where he's you know in Auschwitz and is sort of surrounded by you know the German concentration camps and everything. Um, and even in those in that scenario where he's got he and his fellow inmates have no control over anything at all at least they re retain control over their own mind yes. and over the, how they choose to approach the, the, the situation. So even in the most extreme of situations, we can find the things that we can control and we can focus on controlling those. And I think that's such a nice idea from Stoicism that I, I always come back to. No, that's very well said. I, I My productivity advice from the Stoics would be a question. Mark Schreuer says you have to ask yourself every moment, is this essential? He says, because most of what we do and say is not essential. And he says, when you eliminate the inessential, you get the double benefit of doing the essential things better. And so when I think about how I'm able to do what I do, it's there's the things that I don't do, that mm -hmm. I've stopped doing or that I have delegated someone to do or that I have brought on a team to scale being able to do. And when you get rid of the wasted movements or the wasted thoughts or you stop chasing the things that don't matter or move the needle, you find that it actually, I mean, it takes a lot of energy to be great at something, but it's less than people think. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I think maybe someone would assume that like a writer writes 10 hours a day, but it's like two, mm. you know what I mean? Um, you think that, you know, an athlete is practicing and lifting weights and training all the time, but you know, they're also taking long naps during the day and you know what I, and they and they built a lifestyle where someone's cooking for them and the team takes them from place to like they've also eliminated so much of what is inessential that just concentrated bursts of the essential thing allows them to be best in the world at what they do absolutely and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your advice and tips and stuff over the last three plus years of, of this book coming together. Well, the book is great. Yeah. I think it's going to crush. Fingers crossed, but that's not a thing I can control. So yes, <laughs> I'm not going to think too hard about it. But it already did crush. The way to think about it is that it already yeah. did crush and that it exists. It exists. And, that would and be I'm more, proud of it. That would be I more satisfying nice. if this was the actual book. The hardback. This is the advanced reader copy that we've sent yeah, you away. They're, they're deliberately uh, very flaccid, unfortunately, but <laughs> yeah. uh, it doesn't have the satisfying crud of a, uh, or thud of a, um, of a hardcover, but it exists. And so literally every person that reads it, even if that's seven people and three of them are related to you, mm. it's all extra. Yeah, true. It's all extra. Nice. Sweet, man. Well, thanks. Thank you.